Okay, let's get started. Uh, first of all, thank you everybody for joining our May webinar. This is end of academic year and extremely busy time of the year. So thank you so much for joining. And then we, today we have two speakers and Marina Dubova is a PhD student in cognitive science at Indiana University. Uh, her research focuses on exp experimentation and theory building strategies, as well as, as improving conceptual systems and sciences. And the second speaker is Abdullah Almatuk. He is an assistant professor at the MIT Sloan School of Management. His research aims to improve collective intelligence in decision-making groups. So relevant to today's talk, both Marina and Abdullah are very much motivated and interested in improving the method of uh, social and behavior science. And both will talk about what lessons we can learn from computational science to improve empirical and experimental research strategies in social and behavior science. So as I said, uh, each speaker has 30 minutes he, uh, and speakers, you, you guys have a maximum degree of freedom on that, except the time. <laughs> I will give you a uh, time in the middle of the uh, talk, but um, so that's it. So let's get started with Marina's talk. Marina's talk first. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks again for inviting me to give this presentation with Abdullah today, and thanks for organizing this wonderful seminar series. Uh, my name is Marina and I'm going to present uh, some of the work we've done on using computational methods to shed light onto experimentation strategies in science. So uh, I will have a lot to cover. I will start by motivating this line of research, then I will briefly present in a high big picture the multi-agent model that we developed to address this question of choosing the next experiment in sciences, and then I will uh, show you some of the results that we have and I hope that I will have some time to go through a conceptual replication that another group at a different university has run to um, test the results that we've gathered. So as you see there's a lot of content but hopefully I'll have some time during the talk to address potential clarification questions or discussion questions in the end. So we'll see how this goes but um, let me get started. So probably many people in this room would agree that there are many ways in which we could work to improve sciences. So for instance, in psychology, where I'm originally from, we have the reproducibility cri crisis, we have the theory crisis, we have conceptual crisis, and all of these different things that people are unsatisfied by. Uh, but overall, across many sciences, we could agree that uh, we could be more efficient and uh, yeah, more efficient in learning about the world uh, than we are at the moment. And uh, there are many ways that people have uh, tried to address these problems. And of course, there are many different directions we could go to uh, try to improve the sciences. But what I'm interested in is more looking at the methodological principles that we many scientists are governed by, such as Occam's razor or uh, our intuitions about what the good experiment is. For instance, some people believe that good experiments aim to falsify a theory or good experiments are supposed to discriminate between theories. Uh, and basically many of these ideas, as I noticed, typically come from uh, verbal intuitions that are more than a century old. So, and the, the goal of a computational so social scientist here, I feel like is to build computational and mathematical methods to shed better uh, light onto these intuitions and see if they actually uh, hold true under certain conditions. So, and this is what I'm trying to do. So, and in this project that I'm going to present in detail, we are looking specifically at the uh, epistemic success of different experimentation strategies that are either uh, believed to be good by scientists or uh, sci scientists seem to employ them, but this is just a first project that we've done. So there's a lot of uh, ways to move forward with it. So this is just the first uh, attempt to address this question. And we, uh, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators, uh, Arseny Moskvichov from uh, UCI and Santa Fe Institute and Kevin Zolman from CMU, who are, who are working with me on this project. So we started with the question of how uh, to design the best next experiment. And there are many intuitions that scientists have on this in this regard. For instance, there's one idea 
which uh, suggests that falsification is a good experimentation strategy. So the good, a good experiment is supposed to aim to falsify a dominant theory in the field. Another idea here uh, that is pretty popular uh, in, uh, in scientific circles is uh, crucial experimentation. So basically, this is the idea that a good experiment is the one that helps to distinguish between several dominant theories in the field. So if two theories are giving opposite predictions or diverging predictions on a particular set of settings, that's the settings we need to test. And obviously, many people know that actually many scientists are engaging in confirmatory behavior. So they're trying to set up the, the experiment, either implicitly or ex explicitly set up the experiments that seem to verify uh, their favorite theories. And of course, these are just idealistic strategies, but many people are following a, a big mix of many different factors and uh, many different heuristics. Uh, but many of many of these heuristics will have something to do with at least some of these principles. So, and we wanted to computationally test and, and see whether these strategies help scientists or agents to learn about their environment. So for this, we developed the, uh, a computational multi-agent multi model in which the agents are engaging in both data explanation and data collection, which mutually inform each other. And this, uh, this whole process is, ha is happening in a social setting. So, and I'm going to uh, dive into the details of the model now. So this is a big, big illustration of how the model works. Uh, it has many moving parts. So there are agents, they're building their theories and updating their theories based on new data. They collect the data uh, by, from some ground truth that we are seeding and um, they could communicate either their theories or their results. And I'm going to tell you a little more about these, uh, all these components now. So uh, the way the model works is, uh, first of all, we see some ground truth, which is basically the problem that the agents are supposed to learn about as, uh, as scientists. Uh, and the ground truth in this particular model is some high dimensional space of potential obser observations that are distributed in a particular way. So we wanted to keep this as uh, broad, uh, as broad uh, intuition about the ground truth as possible. So what we did, we simulated, um, in this particular case, we simulated multivariate Gaussian distributions with different degrees of complexity. But basically what they represent in a high dimensional space is either some sort of uh, features that tend to co-occur with each other. So for instance, here you can see that alien's memory capacity is one dimension, alien's brain size is another dimension, and they tend to co-occur and there, there might be some clusters which change the patterns in, uh, under which uh, the features co-occur. And there might be many more dimensions that have different uh, relationships to each other. So the other way to interpret the ground truth that we were seeding is some sort of distribution of causal outcomes, outcomes of causal experiments that a scientist might run. So for instance, if uh, one dimension we could, for instance, um, we could interpret one dimension as a causal dimension of potential experiment that I could run. For instance, I could run an experiment under which I'm trying to causally improve participants' mood in the psychological experiment. And then I'm going to observe a number of other dimensions, which would be the dependent variables, such as increase in participants' memory score or some other things. And basically, these would be co-varying. There, there would be some structure in how the dependent variables are related to independent variables. So this is another way to interpret this multidimensional space uh, with some structure in it. So basically, that was the ground truth that the agents were supposed to learn about. And the way the agents sample the observations from the ground truth space in this model is by conditioning, um, conditionally sampling from the high dimensional space by picking one value along one of the dimensions. So for uh, so in particular, uh, they would they would choose a dimension that they would like to vary, and they would pick a, a value along this dimension, and all the rest would be sampled from the underlying ground truth. So the agents have some control onto what they see. They could engage in some uh, active learning, so they could choose to sample selectively from this region of the space or this region of the space, and they will see the samples that are conditionally generated from the ground truth distribution conditioned on the value on the experimental value. So 
And then what the agents are trying to do in the end is to construct lower dimensional representations or theories to account for the evidence they collected. So the ground truth is very high dimensional, but the agents are trying to compress this high dimensional uh, structure onto low dimensional representations. And these two processes uh, mutually inform each other. So theories could influence what, they, what data the agents end up collecting and the data that the agents are collecting could inform what theories are, or is supposed to inform what theories they come up with. So, and again, the goal of each agent is to construct a lower dimensional representation that captures as much information about the higher dimensional ground truth as possible. And I will dive a little more into the detail here in a moment. So this is again, how the model works or a big picture. There are agents, they communicate, they are updating their theories based on the data and they they conditionalize the data that they see based based on uh, some part of the ground truth they choose to choose to hold fixed in a given experiment. All right. Um, so and I will dive a little more into the details of what we varied in this particular experiment. So uh, we we simulated several experimentation strategies. Um, so in particular, we formulated some version of confirmation strategy, basically the agents that are proportionally sampling from the, from the regions of the space under which their theories are giving the best predictions. Uh, we simulate, we formulated falsification agents, which were basically doing the opposite. They were proportionally sampling from the regions of the space under which their theories have the highest error. So it's basically error-based um, uh, learning. We also formulated some sort of crucial experimentation. Basically, the agents could be paired and they uh, give predictions for different regions of the space and where the and then they will proportionally sample from the regions of the space in which their theories give the most diverging predictions in a pair. And then we also simulated some sort of novelty sampling. Uh, so the agents would, these agents, the novelty sampling agents would try to sample from the regions of the space uh, that would be as different as possible from all previously conducted experiments. And we also simulated a random baseline, basically the agents, no matter what their theories are or the previously collected data is, they're just uniformly sampling from the whole, um, from all possibilities. And we also simulated some hybrid strategies, confirmation plus disagreement, the agents which are partially driven by confirmation and partially driven by disagreement, for example. So. And these would be our main variables of interest. But in order to see, we were expecting that we will see some differences in the context under which some of the strategies lead to the best th theories. So that's why we varied many other contextual variables that I'm going to briefly present now, but they are not going to be our main focus of interest. But this was basically to simulate the agents sampling with different strategies under many conditions. So uh, for instance, we varied between the simulations we varied the group size in which the agents are learning. So there were either five or 10 agents in the group. We simulated the data sharing strategy, uh, the social learning strategies. So for instance, in some simulations, the agents would be sharing their data sets with each other in different proportions. In some simulations, the agents would be sharing their explanations. In some other uh, simulations, the agents would be teaching and learning from uh, their exp explanations. So there were many different social learning strategies that we implemented to see if there would be any effect of the social learning strategy on the success of the um, experimentation strategies. And finally, we varied the complexity of the ground truth. So we, we tested different number of clusters. So some agents, some groups would be learning about much simpler ground truth, which has only two clusters and 20 dimensions, but some other agents would be learning about the ground truth with 30 clusters and 100 dimensions. So we basically varied uh, the complexity of the problem that the agents were uh, dealing with. And finally, this is the way we implemented the agents' theories. So it's obviously a very simplistic way of thinking about scientific, scientific theories, but this is how we decided to start. So, and we basically implemented agents theorizing as, um, as them constructing a neural autoencoders with only one hidden layer. So basically it's very similar to a PCA in this case. So basically the agents would be trying to construct this lower dimensional representation with different um, uh, different degree of expressivity, which we varied across simulations. Uh, so some agents would be constructing 
simpler representations and some agents would be constructing a little more complicated representations with, with three or six inner neurons. But basically they would try, what neural embeddings are trying to do is basically construct a bottleneck if the information, the higher dimensional information is passed through this bottleneck, as much information as possible is preserved and you can retrieve it from uh, the output layer, which in which decodes some information that is hidden in the in the bottleneck. All right, and finally, to evaluate the agents, we we looked at the reconstruction and prediction error. So reconstruction error, we were looking specifically at how well, if you pass the information through the agents' theories, how much you can uncover, uh, how much of the how much, how much of the information is lost. So that's a typical way of evaluating neural autoencoders. But the other, uh, another metric we developed, another task was uh, the agents which were trying to predict unknown dimensions based on the known dimensions. So for instance, imagine you know uh, what kind of weather it is today, but you want to predict what day it is or the other way around, you know what, uh, what season it is, but you want to predict the weather today. And that would be another task that the agents were engaging with. So the autoencoder in this case was masked, masked autoencoder. We were hitting, hitting some of the dimensions of the data and they were supposed to uh, predict the hidden dimensions in the observation. And again, in order to see what the agents are doing, we both calculated how well their explanations were doing according to these metrics on the data that they have collected themselves. We would call it subjective performance or, or on the data that is the actual sample sampled from the actual full ground truth distribution. So we call this objective performance, but you can call it in sample or out of sample prediction error. So basically the how well the agents explanations are doing based on the data they have collected themselves and how well they're doing based on the full ground truth distribution if we sample from the original problem. So and just to go into some of the results that we've gathered. So in the first experiment, we varied all these contextual conditions, uh, which resulted in more than 10,000 different simulations of the model. Uh, and we looked at the learning results of the agents following different experimentation strategies across these contexts. And if we look uh, at the base, base effect, uh, at the main effect ac across the contexts, we find the following picture. So here, I'm just simplifying the results, but basically what I'm showing is the ranking of the strategies according to their subjective performance. So on the top, you see the, the strategies they do, that do better according to how well they accommodate the data that the agents have collected themselves. And we see that confirmation strategy is doing the best. Novelty and random are not doing as well. And um, this was basically what we were seeing in the ranking of the strategies if we align them according to their in-sample performance. But then when we look at their out-of-sample performance, basically, objective performance, how well the, the agent's theories actually accommodate for the data they were, for the structure that they were intending to learn about. Uh, we see that the picture almost reverses. So the random and novelty strategies are now uh, the best of all, but the confirmation strategy is misrep is basically working the worst. So the, the agents who are following the confirmation strategy, they seem to be accounting for the data that they have collected very well. But if we evaluate them, according to the original ground truth or the original problem they intended to learn about, they are uh, failing the most. So, and then we thought it was kind of weird uh, because we expect we expected that falsification or disagreement would be the strategies that, that help the agents learn the most. So that's why, even though we found that falsification doesn't really work, we tried to <laughs> falsify our results. So um, we started by uh, changing the conditions to find some other cases in, under which maybe some of the strategies would work better. So we looked at learning over time. Basically, we hypothesized that maybe uh, there would be some point in time in which uh, the some of these strategies, for instance, the disagreement or falsification would be helping the agents, for instance, only in the beginning of learning, but then maybe a random outperforms uh, the other strategies. And we looked at all the time steps uh, of uh, agents learning and we couldn't find a point in time when an, uh, any of the alternative strategies significantly outperforms random sampling. So then we, we hypothesized that maybe because we see these agents with some random theories, maybe if we pre-train their theories, these theories could guide them better towards better data points. So what we did 
we pre-trained the agents theories with randomly sampled um, data points from the ground truth to a different degree. And we uh, let the agents start uh, collecting the data in an informed way only after they had good, relatively good theories. And we thought that maybe in this case, as we'll see uh, some benefit of using theory guided disagreement sampling or falsification sampling. And we found that if we pre-train agents theories, we find that confirmation works a little bit better than everything, uh, a little bit better than uh, how it worked before, but still overall ranking is the same and confirmation is still the worst strategy and the random is still the best strategy. So finally, we tried to clearly separate dependent and independent variables in the experimental design. So we would fix which dimensions an agent could choose to, uh, to vary in a given experiment because in the previous simulation, the agents could choose to uh, control any of the variables. Uh, but in this particular case, we decided to fi fixate them and see if this would uh, lead to any changes in the results. And what we found is that here and now, novelty and random seem to lead to the same quality of the theories, but all the other rankings is the same. So again, random is either the best strategy or indistingu indistinguishably good strategy from in one of the best strategies, basically. So, and then finally, we tried to analyze the agent's experimentation behavior with a set of information theoret theoretic and behavioral metrics. So uh, I will link the preprint and we have a lot of analysis there, but I'm going to show you only two metrics that we thought were uh, most explain uh, explaining the results the most. So basically, if we, if we ran the, the agent's behavior according to representativeness of the samples that they uh, collect. So by high, we would mean the, the agents who are collecting the samples that are very representative of the ground truth have high likelihood to appear in the ground truth. Low would mean the agents are collecting some really weird data points that have almost no probability of actually occurring if you sample from uh, the ground truth. And if you look at the diversity of samples, basically comparing how different are uh, the agents collected data points from each other, uh, we could see that random strategy is the one that combines high representativeness and high diversity of sampling. Whereas, uh, for instance, confirmation, confirmation agents are zooming into very like very highly probable portions of the space, but they uh, they stay there and they don't explore at all. Whereas novelty strategy uh, leads often leads to high diversity of samples, but sometimes low representativeness of samples. So overall, just to summarize the results, it seems like theory guided experimentation creates an illusion of epistemic success by introducing a bias that prevents the agents from efficiently learning about the target space of phenomena. Random experimentation enables, on the other hand, enables the agents to develop the most representative accounts for the ground truth across all the studied contexts that we, uh, we uh, tested. And this was kind of a weird result and some people got interested in it and in particular one group got interested in replicating this result because it really seems controversial and counterintuitive and this is the group at brown university autonomous Re empirical research group and they were developing a different system they were developing a one agent system that would be uh could be used to potentially uncover the uh, to do both theorizing and experimentation and potentially uncover some uh some loss uh, in psychology or behavioral sciences. So this is a really interesting research. I recommend you to check out uh, their system that they're developing. But basically, to replicate the to replicate our work, what they did, instead of focusing on very uh, not very interpretable uh, multivariate distributions, they focused on things that in psychology we consider our fundamental loss. For instance, prospect theory of decision making is something that psychologists have uncovered and it has a particular functional form. And uh, basically their question was, if the data comes from these laws and not from the multivariate Gaussian distributions, can these strat which strategies would help the agent to uncover these laws in the most efficient way? So basically they kind of looked at the ground truth that is more similar to what psychologists think they are studying. And they themselves implemented these different experimentation strategies uh, which included random, novelty, least confident, basically the agent who's sampling more from the regions of the space under which it's least confident about, uh, falsification and model comparison, 
similar to our crucial experimentation and they simulated theory building with logistic regression which some people would also think is kind of more similar to what scientists or more interpretable theories that are more similar to what scientists are engaging in and their results in in brief um so basically here you can see this mean squared error of the theoretical accounts over time and uh first if we look at the decision making or prospect theory uncover a uh, recovery we see that falsification is actually leads to the lowest error so basically they found that there's a strategy that works better than random but however in all the other cases they found that random is either doing the best or uh, it's indistinguishable from a set of best strategies and in fact if we look at falsification performance which once out for one context outperformed the random strategy we find that it was significantly worse than the ran st random strategy in all the other cases and the the other uh, strategies were either worse or indistinguishable from the random strategy and also they found that um, random experimentation resulted in a high diversity uh, higher diversity of collected samples than, than all the other strategies so just to summarize the results uh, it seems like theory-guided experimentation is very risky. It might work in some cases, but uh, yeah, it might not work in many cases. <laughs> uh, random experimentation seem to facilitate the development of good theories across many contexts. And finally, on the meta, uh, meta insight section, we, it seems like what seems to be a good approach is not always actually a good approach. So for instance, for the um, confirmation agents, they might seem to be doing uh, really great at explaining the data they have collected, but in fact, while in fact misrepresenting the ground truth. And finally, generating more data that is well explained is not the same as learning about the ground truth, uh, which probably we all knew, but this is just one more meta uh, uh, computational in uh, result that suggests this. And finally, these results obviously have many limitations. For instance, we uh, there are many other reasons to prefer theory motivated experimentation that we did not explore, such as experimental cost, perfectly random data collection is impossible in practice, and um, the tested strategies, especially in our simulation, were not validated against real scientists behavior and structure of the problems that they are trying to solve. And this is uh, one of the reasons I'm super excited for Abdullah's talk, because I think his work has a lot of um, a lot to teach us about what uh, what the environments are and what the actual scientist strategies might be. So, and here you can uh, see our paper and the, uh, the replication paper, and I'm welcoming any questions or, yeah, please send me any of the thoughts to the email. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marina, such an amazing study. Uh, we have about four minutes for Q&A. Um, any questions? Please go ahead. Jacob. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you. This is super cool work. Um, so thank you for presenting. My main question is, so you did an autoencoder and then the other group did logistic, logistic regression. I'm curious if you've thought about doing some sort of causal machine learning where they're, you're actually representing theories as causal as opposed to just predictive. And if you think that would make a difference. Yeah, what kind of methods in particular are you thinking about? So there's methods to like try to construct a causal graph that can produce the data that you've observed, which is different than just mm -hmm. trying to find associations that can predict the data. Yeah, I think that's a very uh, great suggestion. We were thinking in this direction, but uh, I think in our simulation case, it would also involve changing the structure of the ground truth. Maybe we, we were also thinking about potentially having the ground truth being generated by a causal graph run versus the probability distribution in the high dimensional space. So that's a really promising direction to go. And the other group, uh, uh, they also were interested in using um, symbolic regression, which is not which is not uh, exactly uh, maybe the, capturing the type of causality you're talking about, but it captures more of the functional forms that people might be interested in. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Abdullah. Yeah, hey, I have a couple of questions, but uh, uh, I think some of them we could even defer to after my talk, uh, if you want. Uh, as uh, 
because as you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of your work and I actually consult Marina a lot on the things that we do in what I'm gonna present next. But uh, I mean, you threw this uh, on me, uh, although it was a, I, I was planning to ask you the question and you said that maybe I'll shed some light on it in my talk. But what's your intuition on what strategy researchers actually do? So of the strategies that you've collected, what do you think this, the current state of affairs in the behavioral sciences looks like? And do you have any idea or sense of how would one quantify that mm -hmm. or measure that? Yeah, that's a really great question. I I should say there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this direction. And there, yeah, a lot of work for both computational social science and for uh, social sciences in general uh, to quantify what sci scientists are actually doing. Uh, so I think th there is some there is some interesting research, for instance, looking at the um, at the paper records, visualizing the the types of uh, experiments that people are doing based on the papers they have published, uh, and looking at how it compares to what they could have potentially done. And this kind of research basically shows that uh, scientists tend to be overly um, overly confirming, which we all probably would not be surprised by. So scientists seem to be taking safer path, uh, paths towards new new experiments that they decide to do based on the previous uh, paper paper record. But of course, the, this type of work has many limitations. For instance, not everything gets published. And uh, also, it's really hard to analyze scientists' behavior without knowing what the ground truth looks like. Because in one ground truth, <laughs> it might look like scientists are overly confirming, but it, in the other ground truth, if we know the bigger picture of what they could be learning about, um, maybe it could be the other way around. So, and I think that's why I'm super excited about your work because uh, as you might uh, might introduce your approach, you are interested in sampling the ground truth first and then seeing what we could map a, what scientists have done in the area based on the on the bigger space of phenomena they could be learning about. And I think that's one way of potentially quantifying at least the degree of, um, yeah, degree of how confirming the agents end up doing or how how diversely they are sampling in the space. So I think there are many ways to do this, but uh, to analyze agents' behavior, we need to see the we need to have some way of potentially quantifying at least some some sub region of the ground truth and mapping their strategies or what they have done in that ground truth, which I think is what uh, you might help us do. <laughs> well, that's like a natural introduction to Abdullah's talk. Um, so although I have a question, I will save it for later. And um, uh, Abdullah, are you, do you wanna share your presentation slides? Sure, although I have three more questions also. Oh! <laughs> but uh, maybe, maybe, maybe I can, uh, uh go over my slides and mm -hmm. then have rather than a specific kind of q a on this work we can just like have it an open right, discussion right. That, because uh kudos for constructive yeah yeah yes i mean i i think i i, I couldn't have uh, picked anyone better than marina to go before me and 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 give her talk because i think it's a nice setup uh mm -hmm. for what i want to say and also i think Again, uh, there is a, a productive conversation that we can uh, we can have. Okay, let me try to let me share my screen. Let's see. Looks fine on your screens. Yep. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about a perspective piece that's coming out in uh, BBS and Behavioral and Brain Sciences. It, I think this, um, uh, I'm not gonna go over the details of the arguments in that paper, but I'm gonna give the high level kind of structure of the ideas. And if anything I say rub you the wrong way, please free to unmute yourself and call me out. And maybe I can dig deeper into uh, what we are trying to say, or maybe refer you back to the paper uh, and uh, 
uh, if I think it addresses some of these uh, concerns. But what I want to do also, because kind of this paper, I think, generated some, uh, it received around 35 commentaries, one of which by Marina and her team. Uh, but there was also some passionate pushback, uh, which if we have the time towards the end, I would like to kind of pick your brain on how to address them or whether you share that uh, that uh, that view that we've uh, gotten on this paper. So actually I have a month to respond to the 35 commentaries that we've received. So towards the end also, if you have any thoughts or ideas on how to address some of the questions that came up, that would be great. Okay. Um, so half of the talk is going to be about this. The second half, which is the perspective piece, the second half is going to be examples. So we are actually doing it, uh, although some of the commentaries argue that it can't be done, uh, or if you do it, it won't actually uh, solve the problem. We're doing it. I'm going to talk about a few projects uh, where we're implementing this uh, these ideas. They are still work in progress, but if it piques your interest, I can talk more about them too. I have a lot of slides. I'll be jumping around depending on the questions that I receive and where the conversation takes us. I can't go over everything that I plan to talk about today. Okay. With that introduction, uh, maybe a little bit of uh, the backstory of this paper or this approach, which kind of started when I was a graduate student at MIT and I was like really um, uh, fascinated by collective intelligence and team performance and when individuals outperform even the best individual in the group. And I wanted to learn more about that. At that time, I came from a, a background in applied math and computational science. So I was doing a bunch of like modeling work and I was in the kind of lit literature review uh, part of my PhD. And this is an area that has generated a lot of research over the past 70 years or so by people in many, many different fields from social psychology to, to uh, management science, to computer scientists. So many fields, many areas, many venues who are asking questions related to group performance. And uh, some of you might resonate with the experience that I had, which is the more I read, the more confused I was. Uh, even for the most basic questions about team or group performance, there was a very long list of things that seemed to matter. And for any one of them, whenever I try to zoom in and see what does the literature say about the impact or the effect or the, what the theories say about the effect of these different um, uh, factors, I end up with something like this, where you have for the same variable of interest for the same outcome, you would find some evidence, experimental evidence that that thing, for example, in this case, and that's where I actually uh, came to this work, where you see like the effect of the efficiency of the network structure of the communication between, between uh, people can improve team performance or simultaneously you could find other evidence that actually it has a negative impact on team performance. And be it link weights, uh, whether the, the homogeneity of the tie strength, skill level, social perceptiveness, skill diversity. So really anything you pick from this very long list, it's not hard to find evidence that this is something that is desirable for team performance or something that's harmful for team performance or has no effect on team performance, all coexisting in the literature at the same time without a real attempt to, to reconcile them uh, or kind of explain the seemingly contradictory results. And that's why kind of it seemed to me that this literature and many of the other literature that I was exposed to afterward lack this character of cumulativeness. They are not building on top of each other and trying kind of to explain these results, but everyone is doing their own little thing, explaining their own results without necessarily seriously uh, trying to uh, fit that results into a bigger coherent picture. Um, my immediate reaction when I was talking to a bunch of my advisors about kind of the state of affairs, one thing was, is this just the replication problem? Is it that actually there is one correct answer? So I don't know, social perceptiveness improves team performance over uh, isolated uh, independent individuals, but you know we have a bunch of false positive results that exist in the literature. And once we solve the replication crisis that kind of people seem to take uh, as, as, uh, as a given, 
it will kind of everything will fall uh, into place. My argument is that it's not that even if all of our findings, and I'm not saying that there isn't an issue of replication and that there aren't like, uh, we need to improve our methodologies to kind of um, increase the robustness of the facts that we generate with our experiments. And I'm gonna focus on experimental sciences here. Even if everything was replicable, cumulativeness would still be loose. It won't be actually easy to integrate our results about the same phenomenon across experiments and across labs. And many very smart people have uh, argued for that in the past. So this is only one of them, but there are many other people who kind of talked about this issue in different terms. This is just one that, I, uh, that really resonated with me. I'm not gonna read what's in there other than Noel here describes how people usually run experiments, which is we try to kind of put things in a framework that allows you to tackle things experimentally in a binary way. So is this group has higher performance than this other group? And you get like a yes, no answer from running these experiments. But it seems that we keep asking the same questions and we don't seem to be answering it. So many people are asking the same exact question. We are setting up our experimental paradigms, asking those questions but we don't seem to be coming up with a satisfactory answer. And he characterized the challenge is that we don't seem to put the results of all of the experiments together. So again, everything is being done in isolation and then there isn't a coherent picture or a framework that allows us kind of to put these experimental results together. And he couldn't convince himself that these results will add up even if we had uh, 30 more years of doing more of the same. And I think, uh, and, and this is kind of the motivation for the perspective piece we did because it's been almost 50 years since kind of Null's uh, influential paper. And if anything, it doesn't seem that we are making progress on putting things together. So the way that I kind of uh, represent the dominant paradigm of how we do, uh, how we run experiments in the social and behavioral science and kind of how Noel des described it verbally. I am just a visual person, so I have kind of pictures to describe what kind of happens. It starts with what we call the one at a time paradigm. That's how we usually run experiments. And it's the criticism, the paradigm that Noel criticized. We start with posing some theoretically motivated hypothesis. So we have some kind of a theory, a set of postulates, and we put on it some math, logic, or something, and then we derive some testable hypothesis, right? And then we wanna go and test this hypothesis in an experiment, but to do that, we have to pick some sort of a setting, some sort of a situation, some sort of a context, for which to run our experiments and some specific population. So what I'm defining as context as one dimension here, it's actually a very high dimensional thing that encompasses many things like the exact you know, uh, uh, modality of the response, uh, the definition of the situation that the participants that they are going to be in, the incentive structure, uh, the task that they are going to perform, all of that kind of defines this context. So you pick some context to run your experiment, and you run it on some particular population that is characterized by some distribution, be it uh, undergraduate students at a particular university, MTurk, some online representative population, you have, uh, or sample, your sample comes from a population that has certain characteristics about it. So you pick some population and you pick up some context to run your experiment. And then you run the experiment and you get your results. And the results are typically something like, Uh, you've been muted. Sorry, I just got muted or I've been muted for a while. Just like five, 10 seconds. Okay. No, for five, uh, five seconds, yeah. Yeah, so what I was saying is that then when you design an experiment and you pick some sort of a context, some part, some kind of a population, these are high dimensional things, you run your experiment and you get some statistical relationship between independent and dependent variables. I'm representing the results of that experiments as the color. So you picked a point in that all possible experiments 
situations, modalities, incentives, and populations that you could have picked to run your experiment. You picked one and you got some results indicated by this color of the point, which is just relationship between some independent and dependent variable. So if this is all you do, it's not really interesting, right? Because all that tells you that that relationship between the independent variable, kind of your experimental manipulation uh, that tests your theory and the outcome holds for that particular situation for that population. But really who cares about MTurk or undergraduate students or that incentive structure that you had to recruit those students or participants, right? So if that's all we could say, it wouldn't be interesting to run experiments. But the appeal of experiments is that you can generalize using something called theory to other range of contexts and populations. So you say that the same relationship that I observed between my independent and dependent variable, the same relationship that I learned that I uncovered from my experiments also holds for other situations and for other populations. And what allows you to do that, to go from that point to that colored region is theory. It allows you to assert or claim that my results are beyond the exact experiment that I run. However, we also know that in the social and behavioral sciences in particular, our phenomenon uh, and our theories only applies for a range of contexts and population. We don't have this universal laws where something you expect it to hold true across all context and population broadly defined, but potentially there is a range of context and population that this results hold for. And indeed, most social scientists, if pressed, would concede to that. And in the discussion section of their paper, they are going to speculate about some scope conditions, you know, about for which their theories might be applicable or their results via their theory is going to be applicable. So kind of within this way of looking at how we do experiments, it becomes unsurprising that experiments run under different conditions, so under different populations and contexts, might uncover different relationships between the same independent and dependent variables that they are interested in, right? Because it might, these different experiments might fall beyond the boundary condition or the scope conditions for which a given results and hence the theory that supports, um, that's consistent with that results might apply. However, because we don't know, like this space, like this picture that I'm drawing here is never explicit. So we don't know how different experiments are actually different from each other. It's very hard for us to actually say anything about uh, how to put these results together or whether uh, it's whether, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, conflicting results are actually because they fall into different regions within that universe of possible experiments that are governed by different theories, or whether they are actually failed replications with false positive results that actually we should eliminate from the literature. You always have that question in mind. Um, so what's the alternative of doing experiments in that way? The way that kind of we propose in that perspective piece, which I show you at least one example, but if we have time, I'm happy, or you have different interests, we can go other, over other examples that we are doing it, is that you start by defining the universe of possible experiments before you start running the experiments themselves. So of course, there is a question of how do you define that? We can get into that with the, I think the concrete examples will make it more, uh, uh, will we'll, we'll give at least one way of defining this universe of, of experiments, but also a lot of the commentary that, and we propose one approach to defining the design space of the universe, of all possible experiments about a particular phenomenon. Uh, we had a proposal for that in the paper and many of the commentaries were alternative ways of doing it that I think are appropriate for different fields, but also complementary to each other. So I think that's part of the productive conversation that we're having with the people who submitted commentaries. But we start by explicitly defining what the universe of all possible experiments for which any experiment you run comes from. It's just a point in that space. So making the space explicit, that's step number one. Step number two is to sample from that universe, from that 
space of possible experiments you could have run in some systematic way. I'm not sure if maybe my use of the word systematic is uh, misleading because many people interpret it as exhaustive. And what I mean is not necessarily exhaustive, but actually sampling from the space in a way using some strategy that would achieve some goal. And that's, I think, where a lot of Marina's work is actually having that space to be explicit and then asking the question, how if we want to uncover the truth of how a phenomenon looks like, then how should we sample from that space? And for different projects, we actually sampled in different strategies, depending on the kinds of questions that we are asking, which I think there is like, a, knowing the truth is one uh, uh, one fine thing, uh, one fine goal to pursue, but there are also people who are more pragmatic, who want actually to sample the space, for example, in a biased way, that serves a particular purpose, which we can also talk about more. But in any way, once you make it explicit, your strategy for sampling becomes also more transparent. On which grounds are you sampling experiments? Are you sampling experiments that are more consistent with your own theory or in, an, in a theory agnostic way or in a particular way that serves a particular objective that you might have in mind? But it makes it very transparent. And then you confront your theories to the entirety of the experiment. So rather than picking up one experiment and saying whether, it confer, whether it's consistent, corroborated your theory, or inconsistent with one particular rival theory, potentially, we have to force our theories to do two things, to explain the results from all of the sampled experiments. So the sampled experiments are the colored ones. Uh, and makes prediction about yet unseen situations and populations or yet unseen experiments. So this is a seen experiment, this is an unseen experiment, and the model says, or the theory says, that this point should be gray, while this point that is yet unsampled should be blue. So the relationship between the dependent and dependent variable should vary across the space, uh, across the design space of experiments. And it should that explanation, that theory, should fit what we've seen and forced to make predictions about things that are yet to be seen. So these are the three steps that we propose. Explicit definition of the design space of experiments, sampling in some systematic, transparent way, then evaluating or theory development that is confronted with all of these experiments and make predictions about yet unseen experiments. We call that the integrative experiment design and integrative modeling approach, where it's the sampling of the experiments and the development of the theory has integration and commensurability across experiments as, a, uh, as an ex-ante goal, as opposed to having meta-analyses that are and review articles that are exposed ways of integration that they don't seem to be able to shoulder the task that we have for them. Um, I'm going to skip this uh, for the sake of time. We have two, at least two ongoing projects that are doing this. Um, uh, it was really hard for me to pick which one to present. I have the other one as backup slides. So if you're interested, because they are different in different ways, even shows you the differences in doing integrative experiment designs in domains that have well-established paradigms versus domains that are a complete mess. Uh, but uh, let me just pick one now and, and, and see where the conversation takes us. So the first project is kind of the continuation of my PhD project. Do groups of reform comparable individuals? Five years later after my PhD, and including three years of my PhD, I still don't know the answer. I know the answer. Maybe now we're getting close when we are done with this project. So the question, are two heads better than one or two mini cooks spoil the broth? The hypothesis is that, of course, the answer, like everything else in the social sciences, it depends. But how can we actually know what does it depend on? And how can we have a theory that allows you what are the conditions under which two heads are better than one? So what we did, we went into the literature and we looked at every experimental task that anyone has used in the 
past 50 years. If it's that in itself took, us, took a couple of years. Uh, as I said, this is an ongoing project that's been ongoing for almost seven years now. Uh, so we went and extracted those, and there are many challenges in how to do that, but we extracted those tasks from the literature. Then for each task that has been used in an experiment in the literature, we used the union of existing theories that describe tasks in team performance literature. This is just a list of a bunch of tasks that we kind of abstract them in a way that allows us to create these uh, dimensions that come from these taxonomies, frameworks, and theories. And we have 23 dimensions that come from the union of those theories. And then we coded each task across those dimensions. So for each task, and we have 71 tasks, and here what I would what I call task is a task class, not a task instance. Each, so for example, something like checkers is a task class. Within it, we can generate many instances that vary in their characteristics within that uh, task class, if you will. So we have many more task instances, but we have 71 task classes. We operate at the instance level, so our space is much larger. And we have 23 features. So each task is described by a vector of 23 dimensions. I'm a very visual person again. This is how it would look like in two dimension. Everything we're doing, we're doing it in the full 23 dimensional space. So don't ask me the first two principal components, how much of the variance they explain, we're not using them. This is just kind of to derive the intuition of what's happening in that higher dimensional space. So you start seeing the distribution of tasks that people have used in the literature. So you can see that tasks like word completion given starting letter is closer to the task of word construction from a subset of letters that's close to word completion given part of a word. And they are quite different from summarizing a discussion, which is closer to writing an ad, which is close to writing a story, which are very different from checkups, for example. So you have like this distribution in the task space of like, you can imagine every task is a point in that high dimensional space. And you can see the distribution of what people have tried so far in the literature. So now we wanna ask a question, do groups outperform compatible individuals? That's kind of, we define the design space of all possible tasks to answer that question. Now we sample, there are three possible answers. I'm making them here categorical, but actually we measure them as continuous variables, the degree for which teams are better or worse than individuals, but there are three possible answers. It's qualitative answers. No synergy, the individuals, the group is no better than the average individual within the group. Weak synergy, the group outcome is better than the average individual, but worse than the best individual. Strong synergy, the group output is even better than the best individual in the group. These are like the three qualitative potential answers with the three possible colors. We pick an experiment, we pick the room assignment task, we implement that experiment, we have people come in the lab or online, they have to assign students uh, into dorm rooms, they chat with each other, they are working on the problem simultaneously, we find that actually there is no synergy. So the answer to that question is red. On the room assignment task, there is no synergy. Then one would be tempted to say that actually there is no synergy for all tasks. That's kind of how we typically run one single experiment. And then in the title, it will never say there is no synergy on the room assignment task on MTurk participants, but it will say something like, oh, process loss overcomes a synergistic gains on complex problem solving tasks, right? Because you want to generalize, you want to say that my results hold for other things too. That's what the title and the abstract of the paper would do, which is kind of painting the space red. However, the knowledge you generated by running that experiment looks something like this. Maybe you know something about the room assignment task, maybe other uh, constraint satisfaction and optimization problems, maybe other problem solving task, but you know very little about whether that result, whether that relationship between the independent variable, which is team versus individual and the dependent variable, which is performance, hold in that corner in the space. So we pick that one, we run the experiment, we find weak synergy. Now we're tempted to come up with this meta theory that says for this range of tasks, process loss, communication cost, and all of these things over power synergistic gains. And that's why for these range of tasks, 
Steiner kind of theories apply that tells you that individuals, independent individuals are better than groups. However, in this corner in the space, the balance between synergistic gains from parallel processing and what can uh, not prematurely kind of uh, uh, converging to an answer would uh, overcome the process loss or whatever story we want to come up with. It says theories are stories, but these are stories that are consistent with these two data points, but they make predictions about all of these experiments that we haven't sampled yet. So we sampled that one over there to test our narrative, our theory so far. And we do this iteratively where we have two steps. We have a theory generation model. This can be scientists. This can be a machine learning model, a causal, uh, a causal machine learning model or not. It can be armchair theory. We don't care. Someone is generating theories that will be evaluated for their fit on the experiments that we run so far and will be evaluated on their ability to predict the effect of intervention on yet unseen experiments. So this model gets rewarded when it makes correct out of distribution predictions. And I say out of distribution because they are under intervention, like we are running experiments. We have an intervening variable. And then we have another model that we call it the adversarial theory testing model. I revised the wording after Marina's talk. It's just a theory testing model that gets rewarded for selecting the experiment so far in this in this uh, project at least that gets rewarded for picking an experiment that falsifies the theory generation model right so we have a model this is what should happen this is where the model is least certain or it's very far in the design space so let's go pick that one until you end up kind of with this characterization of the space so some experiments we run, some experiments we didn't run, but we have predictions on that we can, and that's our meta theory of what are the range of tasks for which you find the different kinds of synergy that is verifiable, that is falsifiable by other people. So if other researcher comes and says, oh, I think the nine dot problem, the answer can't be weak synergy because of my X, Y, Z theory, we go run it if we're wrong. We already pre-registered our prediction, then we are wrong and we have to update our meta theory about how to fit or how to handle that point in the design space that is conflicting with what we currently know. What can we do with this? We can generate new tasks. The distribution of tasks that exist in the literature are not uniform, but people select tasks for convenience because other people have selected those tasks. There are regions in the design space that are empty that we genuinely care about. And now we can tell you what are the experiments that are in these like empty voids in the space. We can generate new features. So when you have two tasks that have, that they are identical in the design space, they are two experiments on top of each other, but systematically exhibit different colors, different relationship between the independent and dependent variable, then that means that we are missing a dimension, a latent dimensions for which to separate those two tasks. And that's kind of where you can generate in your theories? What could explain that puzzling observation? You can examine the, examine the limits of generalizability. If you run this and you find that no matter what task it is, and forget about only team tasks, but whatever your design space is, if across all the dimension of variations that people think matter, the answer is the same then you found some sort of a universal law, which is saying that this relationship holds for all contexts, for all population. We don't believe we live in that world in the social and behavioral sciences. Then if you find something like this, then you have theories of the middle range. So there are theories that have range of applicability. So this theory, prospect theory, applies for this range of risky decision-making tasks. However, something like reinforcement learning or something like expected utility might work for this range of context and populations. And then you have this meta theory that tells you under which conditions each theory apply. And that's kind of theory of the middle range. We're finding some suggestive evidence that we might be in this world. If you end up with something like this, any manipulation, any perturbation to any context and population, you get a completely different answer. Then you are in the tough 
situation where all theories are wrong because we're sampling in this theory, agnostic theory union way. We're not favoring one theory over another. Another, all the theories are wrong. They are not capturing the things that actually matter. Or you are in a domain where there is no hope for theory. And we have another perspective piece currently under review in PNAS, where we imagine if we are in a situation where there is no hope for theory, what would social, social science look like? Because there is no hope for generalizability or learning from one situation to another because this context sensitivity is extremely high. So what can we actually do? And we talk about that, which I think is kind of an interesting uh, exercise, but also in some domains, maybe we're actually there. I think, I conjecture. Anyway, we built a bunch of frameworks that are open source that allows you to kind of contribute to the varying aspects from contributing to defining design space of certain phenomenon. So for the task space, the 23 dimensions, we actually are in the process of publishing a, a web platform that allows you to contribute to new dimensions, to see, to see where your experiment lives in the design space, what are the empty regions that you might want to sample, where do you want to challenge the predictions of our model. So at the construction of the design space or at the uh, sampling from the design space or the integration of results, people can contribute. And we uh, build these frameworks as well as the execution of these experiments. Um, a bunch of different tools, one of which I think the one that had the highest investment, at least from our side, is Empirica, uh, that allows you to kind of define design spaces and sample from them in a systematic way, um, which integrates with sampling strategies. So there are a bunch of open source tools like Axe, for which I will ask you about, Marina, this Bayesian optimization agents for sampling from the design space. What would that look like in your experiments for particular use cases? and integration with crowdsourcing uh, and volunteer science platforms. Anyway, that's my talk. Um, I know I'm a little bit uh, over time. These are a bunch of questions that we tried to address in the perspective piece, but kind of they came in different ways or forms in the commentaries that we can dig deeper into any one of them. Um, and yeah, we can open it up for question and feel free to ask me or also Marina a question because I know that I'm a little bit over time too. Oh, super great. Thank you, Abdullah. Um, let's open up uh, the discussion. So um, anyone who uh, has questions, just like go ahead. Um, OK, Marina. <laughs> Hi, Abdullah. Thanks so much for this excellent, uh, insightful talk. Uh, I'm also a fan of your research. Uh, I was curious about the task space that you were talking about. So it seems like uh, in many ways, the, the project you presented uh, kind of links to the existing tasks in the literature and samples across them, which is probably better than most things we are currently doing anyways. But to think about the future and the, the better way of doing this, how are you thinking you, you touched on generating new tasks in the, in the space that is defined by the existing tasks? Would there be a way to kind of get out of this loop and design new tasks that are not as linked by the task space that is already tailored to the existing tasks? Yeah, what, what concerns? And I think there are two, I can interpret it in two ways and I'll try to answer both of them because I think both are, are quite interesting. One comment I wanna make is that the, the tasks, and the dimensions of the task space are somewhat, uh, I don't wanna say independent uh, from each other. However, okay, let me say it differently. Um, for example, uh, when someone picks a task and they don't say, they say, oh, this looks like a good task, then they are selecting a task from the task space, this implicit task space, although they don't know where it falls within the task space. But, Typically what people do, they will have one theory of task like McGrath, and they will say that, oh, this is a problem solving task according to McGrath, and that's the task that we are selecting. Here, the tasks, uh, the task space, right, uh, was defined first. So we, what are the dimensions that we could characterize tasks across? And then we looked at the task in the literature and mapped them 
into that design space. So in theory, this task space could generate tasks with any values across the 23 dimensional uh, vectors, even the ones that never exist. So a task that has, I don't know, uh, something like uh, high value in feature one, but zero or null on feature three might never existed in the literature. Once it exists, you can find where that task is in the design space. So it allows you to design tasks outside of the sample tasks in the, in the literature. So it's not constrained to the 71 tasks, but any new task that gets published, we can and we are doing currently is we are adding it as a point in the design space. But there is another way to ask, to interpret your question, which is all of the tasks that are included here come from tasks that were used in experiments in the literature. And maybe there is some tasks that in the real world that we care about that if you bring them and you try to, to locate where that point is in the design space, you will, not to, you will not be able because all of these theories were generated with a specific implicit set of tasks in mind. So that tasks will not fit. And that's actually one mechanism for discovering the missingness of a dimension. You say that ah, actually for this task, we need this other dimension of variability to be able to add it. And all of our existing 71 tasks had value of zero on it. So it existed in that latent space, but it was turned off that feature. And now with this new task, this is our first task that has a true value alongside that dimension. And we are actually, this is a continuous thing. So if you asked me a year ago, we had 61 tasks. And because of new papers that were published over the past year, we increased the number of tasks in the design space and anyone can add tasks to, to the task space. And when we can't, that's when you need the new dimension to be added. So that's one way to discover missing dimensions. Okay, Jay, uh, is that answer the question, Marina? Okay, Jacob. Hi, uh, yeah, super interesting talk. And I think I'll email you because I'm interested in some similar things in a totally different area of, of, of like educational studies. But I'm curious, so one thing that I was thinking as you went through this is how easy or difficult it is to come up with new features and how the difference in the social sciences from the physical sciences. So like I, I read a chapter that it's from an old book on mental modeling that was called When Heat and Temperature Were One. And it's a historical study of these Italian experimentalists who had not yet differentiated between the concepts of heat and temperature. And they had a self-consistent model of heat transfer that didn't work because of that. And then eventually people you know, created a new feature in your language of, oh, actually there's these two different things called heat and temperature. But it's, so I'm wondering about, it seems to me maybe the difference with the physical sciences, we don't have good intuitions and and creating new features or, or expanding our ontology is very hard. And maybe in the social sciences, it's too easy. Like we, we all come up, we can easily come up with, with new features, so to speak. And people also like use the same words to mean very different things. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious how you're, how you're guarding against that. Like, are you doing inter-rater reliability on coding your tasks for features and making sure they're actually distinct and all, all of those, uh, those, those sorts of considerations? Now, this is this is an excellent, excellent point. And we struggle with it, right? Because we do think that the social and behavioral science are domains. I mean, the paper we describe as, as um, uh, an area of science that has high causal density. So there are many, many factors, dimensions that actually interact with each other in a very complicated way to determine the outcome. And that's why, you know, we never believe that there is uh what uh, andrew gilman calls true zeros right so anything that plausibly could affect the outcome does affect the outcome under certain conditions some of the time under certain range of possibilities and conditions you can make it happen right it's everything that could happen will happen at least some of the time under certain kinds of conditions um so it is an area of very high kind of what we call high causal density what paul Mill would call it the crud factor um what other people have called it ambient noise. It's exactly as you said, it is much more complicated. And I think that's why our methods and theories has to match the complexity of the phenomenon of interest. We couldn't expect 
the same experiment methodologies and almost philosophy of si the linkage between the methodology and the philosophy of science that applies for areas of high causal density like physics or the natural sciences to transfer as nicely to the social and behavioral sciences. Uh, and our methods will, or at least our theories, which is, I would argue, the goal of our theories is to build uh, an accurate representation of the truth, will have to mirror the nature of the object of study. Um, and that causes some issues. Uh, some of which, some of your, your, your questions, uh, some part of your question is at the theory building level. And, 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 I, and I've been thinking about that and I think we can like dig deeper into it of how I'm thinking about it. If anything, I'm now pushing against the requirement of interpretable theory because if nature is, it has high causal density that you can't put all of the underlying causal uh, mechanism into your brain and simulate what would happen to generate this subjective sense of understanding. If it's not possible, then maybe, you know, nature doesn't care that it's not interpretable to a human. Uh, so maybe we have to move away from that. And how would that look like? We make a little bit of that argument in, in, in that paper, but in the response, which will come out at some point, we will, I think, make it much more explicit and hopefully convincing. On the other part, which is the construction, so that's the theory building, the last step. On the construction of the design space, I think there are more uh, not obvious answers and or pos uh, possibilities that the researcher can use their intuition to construct that design space. So what we did in this team space project, we came up with the union of all existing theories that we found. Mm -hmm. But there might be some dimensions or some theories that we're missing that are important that they weren't captured by that. So we sent surveys to experts in the field and we asked them which dimensions are missing. They enumerated some dimensions. We had some people suggested uh, adversarial collaborations. We actually had a consensus, mini consensus meeting where we met with five people who are extremely prominent researchers in the field in management science. And we said like, do you agree that these are the relevant dimensions of, of variability? You don't have to agree with all of them, but anything that you think matters should be there. If it doesn't matter, we'll add it, but we will see that empirically, right? So that's like consensus meetings, adversarial collaboration, what we call the research cart uh, cartography, which is like you do like literature, survey of the literature, one way to do it. In another domain, it was a very different experience to design the, the design space. So we have another project that's in the cooperation field, so paying personal costs for a shared benefit. Economists have these public good games, which is a well-established paradigm that they think, which is also a mathematized uh, paradigm for uh, answering those questions. And then we could easily, and also they have, a bit of a mess. So we are asking the question, what's the effect of punishment on improving cooperation? And there are some positive results. Punishment is good, punishment is bad, or oh, it depends, and a bunch of similar experience. Any area I get into, I find the same thing. Um, so we, just because of the uh, preciseness of the public good paradigm, it's very well parameterized. We can actually, we defined easily 20 dimensional space that defines all PGGs. And we could easily, so this is our implementation of the PGG. And then we could easily project all the experiments we found in the literature that studied the effect of punishment. So each paper is a single red point, right? They studied the effect of punishment under those set of 20 dimensional parameter space. And this is in the pilot, what we already implemented, the orange ones and the gray ones are the ones that we are going to sample. And here we use something that's like more soluble sampling when we got the advice of Marina. So there are email exchanges between the two of us. But in this way, the design of the design space, the construction of the design space was extremely easy because we picked a domain where the dominant paradigm is very well parameterized. We are doing the same in the nudge literature, so nudging. 
And there it's even messier than the team performance. Uh, and we're like using a different set of strategies. Uh, this is a, a long-winded answer, but it's, it's, and my answer is probably unsatisfactory because the answer is it depends on the question and the domain that you are in, how would you construct the design space? And the theory building one, I have some strong views now on theory building that many people differ, like don't necessarily agree on that we can talk more about it if you want me to try to practice my argument and why we should potentially entertain true theories or theories that represent the underlying causal mechanism correctly, although are, or don't generate the subjective sense of understanding. But mm -hmm. maybe we leave that for another time. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, very. I, uh, my head is spinning on this. Uh, um, very, uh, I mean, yeah, this, this challenge of designing the sampling, designing the space, seems that it all turns on whether that, whether you can really do that. Um, and you, you've taken a really sensible approach to doing it. I do wonder, I mean, could, would it make sense to try to have another team that wasn't deeply familiar with how you do it try to do it and see if they came up with something similar. And the question is, right, if you train them too much, I mean, you hate, them to, hate for them to just do something that doesn't make any sense. On the other hand, if you tell them exactly how to do it, they'll do it the way you did it, which isn't necessarily the way that nature does it. Uh, and so you, you'd like to be able to give it to another team of smart people and have them come up with something very similar. Um, and of course, that would be expensive and impractical. And I, I, see, it, I see all the problems with it. The other thought is, I wonder if, and this is statistically dangerous, you could assume there is a coherence that things that are near each other in the space should produce similar results, and then use noisiness, you know, basically try to sort, do clustering on your results, and then try to figure out what the dimensions would be that would give you a coherent clustering. But then, of course, you're you got nothing to test against. You're you're really doing using the data for for hypothesis creation and not for testing. And data is precious. Anyway, a couple of thoughts. Now, these are excellent excellent points. So I do think again, like the construction of the design space, which is this first step, uh, can get a little bit messy. Uh, but I think it's necessary. I think it is necessary if we want our conclusions and our work to be commensurate with one another to talk about how similar or different the context and the population for which we are testing our theories look like. Like that's, that's going to be a requirement. And doing that post hoc with meta-analyses, review article, and just thinking really hard is making very slow progress for this cumulativeness. And baking it into the design, it's a requirement, is something that will like we argue that it will it will make meaningful improvements. Um, one question, so for, for, for answering that, again, I said like it's a little bit domain dependent. So we tried in the team project, three approaches and we used them all together. Surveying the literature, uh, surveying experts using their intuition, what do you think is missing? Because we're using the union of all of that, right? We don't, it's, we don't wanna miss anything. It's fine to add something that eventually we discover that doesn't matter, but we don't wanna miss something uh, that actually matters. Uh, many consensus meeting, like you're gonna be our reviewers. Do you now sign up that once you see the paper, you don't ask us that, oh, but you're missing that dimension. Right, because you're the editors of our journals and you're the reviewers. You like pre-register now anything that you think matter. Um, we did it in the cooperation thing very differently because we don't have to ask anyone. We already know it's a domain that's well parameterized. No one can dispute it within the field. So that was a very different experience. But let me add something about the construction of the design space, which is whatever design space you start executing sampling experiments from and building your theory doesn't have to be fixed. 
So as we sample experiments, we are eliminating dimensions because you tell me this dimension matters and I keep sampling experiments along that dimension and it just isn't doing anything to the results. Uh, and then it's like, you think that your theory says this thing matter. All the empirical results from our experiments are falsifying it across all conditions and populations. So you know what? Your theory, that part of your theory is eliminated. So we're reducing the dimensionality of the space. But also as we are sampling experiments that are dense in the same area and we get chaotic results, results that are very sensitive to perturbations in that region, then we step out and we say, oh, you know what? We need some sort of a, this these are odd observations that require further theorization, which right. then we add dimension. What's different add, about these? Yeah. And we add what? that dimension and then label all of the previous experiments along that dimension, because maybe we were setting it to false or zero. I see that. That 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 right. yeah, I, I see how that emerges. You look for areas of noise and it's try to figure out what's different about these experiments than code so everything like that way. That does emerge. And expanding. So it's it's a starting point. We will never tell you that, oh, this is the universe of experiments that is fixed and now let's do it. As we build theory, as we we're constructing the space and iterating. Like I don't subscribe to the view that some people think that I subscribe to sometimes in the way I describe things to this waterfall approach. By the end of this, we have the answer. We get closer to the inaccessible truth, but it's a never ending pursuit. But this is a, some systematic way kind of to head towards that direction of the truth. I hope these last. And, and you had the second yeah, question. So no, it's about the construction of the space. Maybe I'll just make a quick comment about what you said. So the distance in the space, I'm very worried to say that you sample based on some measure of Euclidean distance. So for example, these two points are closer to these two points in an Euclidean, or oh, sorry, this point and this point, right? They are mm -hmm. further away in an Euclidean sense than this point and this point, which they fall across a boundary condition. So you can imagine the same thing if you are looking at the physical state of H2O, water, right? It can be qualitatively solid gas or liquid. And around these phase transitions, the qualitative behavior of the molecule is much more significant than some quantitative difference in some other direction. So it's a distance in some theory space, some model space, that these two are more similar because we expect them to have similar outcomes, similar qualitative behavior than those that span across boundary conditions. And actually in the sampling strategy, one thing that I wanna consult Marina on as well is, is just kind of looking for these lines of uh, flip, of the sign of the coefficients of the relationship between the independent and dependent variables, because that's like two experiments that are as close as each other in their in everything, but that exhibit the most difference in sign, right? So that's minimal difference in characteristics, but opposite sign. And that's kind of where you would find where this kind of, uh, uh, you know, the second derivative of the theory that predicts it's a qualitative shift in behavior. But again, we can spend time talking about that. So these are, I think, does that answer the two questions? Okay. Jacob. Think, Jacob. Yeah. Jacob, you had a question? No, it's okay. Oh yeah? yeah. Okay. Uh, Rafat? Thank you. This is fabulous work. Uh, how would this apply when the time dimension kicks in? Like so, so maybe some relationship are in the current instance of time, they seem to be contradicting, but if it if they're giving time. And this is what happens with qualitative ethnographic archival mm -hmm. research. Thank you. That's a very good question. What if one of the contextual dimensions is time and time is changing the outcome in some meaningful way, right? Uh, then, and, and I've heard this defense actually, 
there was this replication project where to defend against the original authors of the original experiments, not to say that, oh, your experiment found, didn't replicate because it did something differently. They spend a lot of time in the lab of the original author and they said, do you sign up that this is as close as it's like, this is an exact replication. We know that there isn't an exact, replication, but this is as exact as it is to your nature paper. And it was a paper published in nature. The author said, yes, I agree. They ran the experiment and it didn't replicate. What did the author say? Our results were true in 2010 or whatever, but the world has changed in meaningful way that even if you fixed everything that you could fix, it's no longer true. We concede to that. So there is this question of like temporal validity of a result. I view it in something like this, like this mm -hmm. limits of generalizability. If you believe that the domain of the like temporal validity of a theory or of a result is very short-lived. Every second, the world changes and you can't learn, nothing generalizes from the previous seconds, then uh, from the previous instance in time, then you are in an area where like, there is no hope for generalizable knowledge because knowledge generated at one point in time doesn't generalize to the next point in time, then there isn't anything we can learn that we could apply in the next time step. That's like the most chaotic, like you're in a, some sort of a chaos, right? Uh, some nonlinear, and we do that. We have that like in weather prediction, right? You can predict whether it's gonna rain in the next minute. You can predict using these weather forecast models, which we know something about the physical system and the governing equations, that it might rain tomorrow, but there is no model, and we have a theory for why it can't happen. There is no model that can tell you that it's going to rain on Boston on July 2nd, 2024, or something like that, because the error propagates and this path dependency thing makes it make some kinds of predictions impossible. And we have a mathematical theory for why they are not. I think if we are in a domain where we think that happens, we have to know that we are in that kind of a domain where if, if temporally stable, then that's fine. You know, and I can't talk actually about how Facebook deal with that problem. They run the same, like they do, I, I, I like now Meta, they have like the strategy where they run the same experiments continuously, although they know the A-B test, which arm is better than the other for getting people to click on an ad, but because the it's temporally unstable, something changes about the world, and now the blue color people associate with some political party, and now it changes how they go to ads that have like a lot of blue in it, and that changed after the world has changed. So they continuously run what they call anchor experiments to monitor how does the effect of an intervention changes over time. And once it changes, they always try to adjust, or oh, if it's changing in that, it's shifting, it's temporal shift rather than nothing matters, but our knowledge shifts. And then they sample experiments in a smart way to adjust to the, to shift with, to shift their model about the world as it's shifting with time, which is very clever. I think these like industry people are taking the, scientific method more seriously than most scientists in the social sciences, but so there is a lot to learn, I think, from there. But that's kind of getting at your question of, I think, the temporal validity. If you believe it's stable, then you can't use it as an excuse. If you think it's completely chaotic, then there are things, another domain where there is, we have a theory of unpredictability is efficient market hypothesis. We have a theory that's even mathematical that tells you that you can't predict over time whether that theory is right or not, because maybe empirics don't, people are systematically beating the market, so it's not exactly right. However, if you believe there is no hope for theory, then we should have a theory of unpredictability like other mm -hmm. fields, why? If you think things are temporally stable and shift slowly, if they are completely stable, then it doesn't matter. If it shifts, then there are strategies to deal with that and the time scale for the shift actually matter for how much 
our results generalize across the dimension of time. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I feel like I'm giving very long answers to some really, but, but these are like very important Fascinating, questions. fascinating. Uh, it's actually stimulating. So I'm, I'm, I'm just like thinking out loud as you're asking those questions. Does that answer your question or address at least some of it? It, it addresses it and in, in, a, in a way, especially in organization studies, when you like in ethnographies where you stay for a long time in an organization, so the nature of the conclusions or is taking time to develop. Uh, this kind of study is not short-lived, short-time experiments. Does is is this method compatible with this? Yeah. Okay. So that's a slightly different. I think both are excellent questions. I maybe I slightly misunderstood. Uh, unless this is a separate question. Um, so this is not. So when we are talking about nudges, those are not. They are like ethnography. So you want to nudge employees to exercise more and like these mega uh, studies by like Katie Milkman at Wharton and colleagues, they run for a year, for example, because you wanna see like whether in the control and treatment given that voucher or that intervention works or not similarly for vaccination. So there are, this is not incompatible with outcomes that are, that, are not lab experiments. This is not specific to lab experiments. That's one way to answer it, which is where people can come in. And we are actually running lab experiments that are blurring the line between what is lab and field. It's so like lab experiments, but people come back to the platform and make predictions and interact with each other over an extended period of time. So I don't think the aspect of time for how long does a mechanism, hypothesized mechanism, or theorized mechanism had to uh, operate for an outcome to happen. I don't think that's uh, that's an issue for this, other than it makes it harder. It makes it slower, the sampling of experiments, the accumulation of observations. So if anything, it's important to be in a well-defined design space such that each experiment is maximally informative because each study, each empirical observation is extremely expensive in labor costs, not only. So you want it to be exactly fitting with everything and it's even more important to be you know, uh, systematic in where to do it or how to do it, or the one that you did it for which range of context and population does it apply, it even increases the importance and value of it. So that's at the kind of time scale of the phenomenon itself. Mm -hmm. Then there's the conclusion, whether it changes over time, which is kind of my previous kind of uh, uh, thoughts we're addressing, which is, or the mechanism is right, but the mechanism is changing over time. And we don't know what will, what is path dependent and the future is maybe unpredictable, quote unquote. Both helpful, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Great. Uh, this is such a great webinar, I loved 